So it's on Blackboard, and it's inside the reference material section. So reference material, and then right at the very top, uh, we have the glossary. Of course, and it's done according to classes. That's the way I decided to do it. And, um, there's still some repetition in here that I need to, uh, to get out. So it starts off with electrical. And then it, uh, there are some terms like, uh, normally open, normally closed. I should understand those, right? And of course, relays. I know what a relay is, right? Well, what I've done on the study sheet is I split it up into the sections where you can find these terms at. Y'all see the way it is? You mean like where it's in the network? Yeah, so that would be the section that it's in to the right. network. And in computers, you should have a section where you can find these in computers. <coughs> so if you look at the computer section, for, there, is there any on electrical? I think there is. Uh, so if there's any questions on anything or explanations or definitions inside there. Some of y'all uh, might not have had uh, AC yet, so let's look. Uh, let's talk a little bit about impedance. Uh, the problem we have in AC is AC is a varying signal, right? And it's moving at a rate. What do we call the rate of the of the AC? The frequency, right? Uh, then we have two components that react to that. So a resistor, a 100 ohm resistor, will always have 100 ohms of opposition. Is that AC or DC opposition? Either. Yeah, a 100 ohm resistor don't care if it's AC, don't care if it's DC, it has no, has no problem with that. But we have two other devices that we use <coughs> uh, that we call capacitance. So we have devices called capacitors. And these devices are basically two wires separated by an insulator. We call the wires on a on a made capacitor. <coughs> we call the two wires we call them plates. But basically if you put AC on a cable and there's a wire next to it and you got an insulating material between them, you have created a capacitor. We call that parasitic capacitance. So sometimes well, we want the capacitance to be there, sometimes we don't. And this can, uh, parasitic capacitance can, can cause problems. But what happens is that when you put AC on a capacitor, it has, if you put DC on a capacitor, it acts like an open circuit. Uh, it, it, it goes through a charging phase. And how fast it charges depends on how much resistance you put in series with it. We have what we call an RC time comp. If you don't have any resistance, then the capacitor charges instantly. Uh, the problem we have is that if we if we had the ability to measure the voltage drop across the capacitor, uh, so if I, I start off with a bucket and the bucket's in, so how much water is it when the bucket's in? Okay. So on a capacitor, when we put voltage on it, that sucker has, the instant we put voltage on it, it has zero opposition. And it drops zero volts. So current is maximum because it's looking at zero opposition, right? You understand that. And voltage is minimum, which is opposite of a capacitor, a resistor. If I put maximum volt, a voltage current through a resistor, then the voltage drop across that resistor will be maximum. So what happens as the capacitor charges, the voltage drop goes up. So that would be like the bucket going up, right? You understand? And the closer we get to the top, it's just like you fill in a bucket. What do you usually do when you're filling a bucket? You start off pouring it up real fast, and the closer you get to the top, you start doing what? Slow down. 
until you get up to the very tip and then you stop. Well, that's what happens with a capacitor. If you think of the water as current, then what happens is when the capacitor is charged, there is no current flow through it, but the voltage drop across it is maximum. The capacitor, the current flow is not through the capacitor, so the capacitor does absolutely no work. It does no watts. It, it doesn't do watts. But it appears to have current flow in it, right? You understand. But what happens is the voltage and the current are out of phase with each other. When the current is maximum, the voltage drop across the capacitor is what? Minimum. When the voltage drop across the capacitor is maximum, the current flow through it is minimum. Did I say that right? Yeah. So no voltage drop, maximum current. Maximum voltage drop, minimum current. So the current and the voltage are out of phase with each other. And this creates some really, really neat things. But what happens is the amount of opposition that it has. So when we buy capacitors, we don't buy them in ohms. We buy them in their, with a, their ability to hold a charge, and it's called capacitance. So the bigger the capacitor, the more, the faster it'll charge, I'm, I'm sorry, the slower it'll charge. That makes sense. So it appears to have lower opposition in AC circuit. In a DC circuit, we use these things for timers all the time. We call them RC time constants. In an AC circuit, we use them to vary their opposition with what? Frequency. So the actual formula is down here at the bottom. So if capacitance goes up, opposition goes down. If capacitance goes down, opposition goes up, right? Uh, frequency. If frequency is zero, if I calculate x of c, if zero is on the bottom, zero divided in, multiplied by any number is zero, and any number divided by zero is what? Huh? Well, we say it's infinity, but infinity is a relative term, right? We've never reached infinity. So at DC, it has zero, I mean, it has maximal opposition. And then AC, it, its frequency varies with what? I mean, I'm sorry, it's, its opposition varies with frequency. So we can use these. We can use them to pass certain frequencies. We can use them as what we call filters. Filters is where we can block frequencies and allow frequencies to go through. We do that all the time. We use capacitor. Their main... Their main focus in life is filtering. To get rid of frequencies we want, we don't want, and let frequencies pass that we do want, that we do. So we have band pass fist filters, we have band stop filters, we have, we have all different types of filters we can use this. Originally, this was the way we tuned in radio stations. So if you ever took apart an old tuner, uh, you would find a capacitor in there. What you're doing is you change the capacitance, and what you're doing there is you're tuning in a radio station, right? I understand. Or what you're pretty good. Are we okay? So as frequency goes up, capacitive reactance goes down. Now then we have another device called an inductor. An inductor and capacitors are exactly opposite of each other. So an inductor is nothing but a, coil, a bunch of coils of wire. When we put DC on an inductor, it acts like a wire. And a wire has very, very low resistance, right? It depends on what, what determines the resistance of a wire. Four things. That, you shouldn't know this. What's the four things that, that determines the resistance of a wire? Huh? The material is made out of the size of the wire, the length of the wire. It starts with a T. E, M. The temperature of the wire operates in. Uh, in fact, we have a device called an RDT, which is a which is resistive temperature detector. And basically, what does it depend on? It depends on the resistance of the wire changing with temperature. And it's pretty linear, guys. I mean, it's really, really neat. As temperature goes up, what would you think the resistance of the wire would do? If the temperature goes up, what would you think the resistance of the wire would do? 
go up back. So we use uh, inductors. You'll see these guys depends on the inductions that they have, but it's just going to be loops of wire wrapped around something. It's got to have some type of core. We can have air core. The more you move toward metals, the more inductance it has for the same amount okay. of turns. So we have air core inductors. We have variable conductors, which they'll have a ceramic or, or tube rod, and you you adjust a, a, a ferrous thing down inside it, and you can change what we call the uh, reactive core. I've got a Rosa applicant here. So what happens with the inductor when we put AC on it? Then and it's a, a, co a coil of wire. When current flows through the wire, it generates a magnetic field. That magnetic field cuts the other wire next to it, which generates an EMF in the opposite direction. So what it does is it blocks light. It wants to block AC. So they don't like things moving real fast. Now what's so neat, if we if we were to uh, look at this thing, is it's basically the same formula, C pi L L. This is the size of the inductor. This is this is uh, how we rate an inductor with its ability to store a magnetic field. But notice it's not, there's no one over it, right? You understand? So I've got this reciprocal over here. I've got this over here. And if we put these things in the circuit at the same time, uh, they will cancel each other out, but they will cancel each other out at a certain frequency. We call it the resonant frequency. So what we can do with this guy is we can make what we call band pass filters and we can make what we call band stop filters. And this is basically what your old tuners used to be. Is you were setting up a, an inductor and a capacitor. Usually the inductor was fixed and what you did is you changed the value of a capacitor and you'd set up a resonant frequency and let the carrier come through. So if you ever look at your, your AM or FM dial, uh, that's what they're telling you. They're telling you what the carrier frequency is. So what they're doing is they're broadcasting. All these things are riding on this air at the same time. We call it multiplexing. So multiplexing <coughs> is a technique where we let multiple signals occupy the same the, the same media at the same time, right? And then we have to we have to have the ability to demultiplex them, and that means we we strip off what we want and we block everybody else, right? You understand? Thank, thank goodness. It is now. It's called a face lock loop. Now we don't use inductors. The problem with inductors and capacitors is uh, <coughs> is they're t they, they change with temperature because uh, an inductor uses nothing but wire. But what happens with wire when you get it hot? Its resistance goes up. Now, its inductance doesn't change, but its resistance goes up. Uh, but capacitors, if you change the size of the plates, so if you get a capacitor hot and the plates get closer together or get bigger, then their capacitance value changes. If the capacitance value changes, it means the resonant frequency changes. So anybody that's old school, everything we had had what we call a fine tune knob on it. So what you do is you, you tune in a station and you'd be watching it and all of a sudden it'd start getting, you'd go up there and tune the fine tune a little bit because your TV has it heated up, you had to retune it in. Uh, of course, after it got warm, you had no problem. It's just that when you turned it on, uh, uh, phase lock loops are really, really neat. They beat it against a reference frequency. Uh, this is what we use now. So yeah, it's done electronically now, uh, tuning in. Sometimes we still filter. We still use these things to filter all types of stuff. So if you ever looked at the, at the motherboard or inside your phone, you're going to see hundreds of capacitors in there. So, cause there's so much going on and so much switching noise and all kinds of stuff. You need to be able to filter that out. Inside power, capacitors, you're going to see, uh, inside power supplies, you're going to see, uh, capacitors in there. Just, but their, their main function in life is what we call filtering. Another problem that we have is that, uh, it's called impedance matching. And we're not going to look at this, uh, in other classes, we'll talk about that. But impedance matching, it says the maximum power transfer, uh, transfer, the maximum power is transmitted in a communication system when the output impedance of the transmitter matches the input impedance of the receiver. So impedance, what's impedance? The total opposition measured in ohms of an AC circuit that contains both reactive and resistive devices. The letter Z is used to represent impedance and formulas. So all your ohms long formulas could be changed to impedance formulas 
instead of using instead of using R for resistance, you understand what we'd use? We'd use X of L or we'd use X of C. And then you'd be solving for impedance. That makes sense? Now what happens here is it says the total Z is represented, the total impedance is calculated by the vector sum of the commonly, I'm sorry, wrong thing. Uh, in high speed communication system, the characteristic impedance of the connecting cable must also match the impedance of the cable. So in communication systems, we don't, uh, we don't let the impedances be set arbitrarily. We set the impedances of the system. If I set the impedances of the system, then I can match impedances inside the system. Does this make sense? And if I get impedance matching, then what do we have? First sentence, maximum power transfer in the system. So that's why we have all these different types of cables. We have coax cables. So if you, if you, if the cable on the table, my, my father-in-law did this. He was pulling a truck and broke the cable, the coax cable running uh, through his house. He got up there and broke it and he twisted the wires together. And his TV, on, the picture on his TV was now awful. Because what did he screw with? He is he he and he screwed with this guy right here. He screwed with the characteristic impedance of the cable. So that cable depends on that cable depends on two things. It it may it it, cre it creates a capacitor. It has a conductor. It has an outside conductor, and it has an insulator. It sets up that capacitor. That capacitor has a certain impedance at a certain frequency. Right? You understand? Uh, you cannot measure the impedance with an ohmmeter because this is not a DC. You can't measure impedance with an ohmmeter, period, because it depends on what? Frequency. So we don't have anything. Normally, uh, we do have some, uh, a lot of your meters can measure can measure C. I've never seen one that can measure L. That's about it. We can calculate it, right? We can, we can put a, a frequency through it, and then we can measure the current flow in and out of it. But what's neat is these devices do not create any electrical power. Uh, we call it apparent power, which really becomes interesting. So when we build cables that are used in a communication system, we have to guarantee that we keep the impedance of the cable the way it's supposed to be. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so, it's going to be what's on that list. You got it out there? So what we're going to do, uh, look at today, uh, before we start going and working on our programs, is we're going to look at how to make a network cable. And network cables, by George, you have to maintain certain specifications on that cable or you screw up the characteristic impedance. If you screw up the characteristic impedance, then the network cannot run the speed it's designed to run it. Now, the, what we have now is we're dealing with what we call gigabit ethernet. But before gigabit ethernet, we had 100 megabit ethernet. Before 100 megabit ethernet, we had 10 megabit ethernet. Before 10 megabit ethernet, we had 5 megabit ethernet. Now these switches and these routers and these computers are very smart. They're going to try to establish communication. So what that means is to get gigabit ethernet, everything in the communication system has got to be almost perfect. If you screw it up, then and it can't communicate. When it starts trying to establish a communication, it can't communicate. Then what's it going to do? It's going to drop down to the what? The next speed. If it can't do it there, it's going to do what? Drop down to the next speed. So you might you might be on a gigabit Ethernet running at five megabits because you you didn't build your what? You didn't build your cables correctly. So and of course. Uh, we don't have gigabit. We got a gigabit switch over here somewhere, but we don't have it down here. The best we can do down here is 100 megabit. And then Wi-Fi is a lot less than that. So when we look at building this cable, we're going to have to maintain certain things about the characteristics of the cable so we don't screw up the impedance. And I've seen people don't understand this, and they don't make these cables correctly, right, to understand. And then they can't understand why their network is what. So slow. Well, I got gigabit. Uh, what else is on there?
on the, the electrical section that y'all don't understand. Huh? Okay, computers. Okay, what's on there about computers y'all don't understand? Are y'all okay there? A what? I might have spelled it wrong. Oh, it's compiler. I'm sorry. I just okay. spelled it wrong. And we see this all the time. When I'm de- so what's what's a compiler? And that's one reason I wanted to give it out. Somebody tell me. Hold on, this is Nancy. I know I'm not supposed to do this. Up here in our uh, TIA portal. And it'll tell you that. It'll pop up there compiling and say compiling, compiling. Uh, what we do on uh, on the RS logic is you do the little check, right? You understand? And what it does is it compiles the program over and sees if there's any error. Uh, y'all understand? My uh, computers has have no idea what la- what language does a computer speak? Binary. We call it machine language or object code language. Binary language. When you write a ladder diagram, you are not writing ladder. You're not writing a binary program. Everybody understand that you're writing a graphics program. So what you have to do is you have to convert that program before you download it or download it to the machine. It has to be converted from what? Ladder Ladder over to machine language. Okay, y'all understand that? Yes or no? So we have two methods of, so, uh, you know, the Bible was not written in English. The Bible was written in Hebrew, right? Okay. So what did they do? Well, that's one or two things. So I'm up here giving, I'm, I don't understand English. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't understand German. And some, and the, and the German does not, and the, and the man speaking German does not understand English. We go through a what? A translator. Okay. I understand that. But that, we don't call it trans, so we have to go through translation. That would be informed, but we call those people, we call them interpreters. So interpreters are on the fly. So interpreters would be like, uh, when you, when you have a Logic Pro program, it's never actually translated into a machine code program, but it's, it's, the whole program's not translated. It's interpreted as you run it, right? You understand? So interpreters do it a line at a time, and they never generate a machine language program. So if I wanted to go back and go back over the speech the guy had, then I'm going to have problems unless I do what? Unless I compile it over. So what they did with the Bible is they compiled it. So what does, compile, how do, what does a compiler do when you translate it? It actually converts it from a what? From a high, from this language over to another language. So compilers create a new program. The program that they do is going to be in a completely different language. Of course, on our PLC, the language is going to be what? Ladder. I'm not, no, in the PLC, in the PLC, the language is going to be what? The binary language of the microprocessor. So anytime we download a program to the PLC, it has to go through a what? Compiler. It is it is completely converted over, right? You understand? Uh, the program the the program that we keep is called the source code. So the source code is not a machine code program. It's just a bunch of codes representing how we draw things out, right? You understand? That makes sense. And then we take that graphics program, and then we do what? Then we compile it over. Does that make sense? If we run the simulator, the simulator is not a compiler. The simulator is a what? It's an interpreter. Y'all, y'all understand the difference? So interpreter would be like I'm listening to somebody in German, and they're he's, he or she's saying something, 
and then they translate that into English. That's what an interpreter does. It's on the fly. We never have that speech written down. A compiler would be the guy gives his speech to the compiler. He takes that speech and converts it over to English, and then I read that. So that's the difference between a compiler and an interpreter. So anytime we have a program uh, that we that we have, I'm, it's not going to be able to download it. It'll tell you that it's compiling, right? When you when you say download, it says compiling, or we can check it for errors before we try to download it. So if you look at the uh, the top beside the download button, there's a little icon there. If you if you hover on it, it'll come up and say compile compile. So that way you can check it for for errors before you do what download. So that's just like on the RS Logic uh, 500, you have the little computer you can click on, right? You understand? I, I like the way that uh, RS Logic 500 did it a little better. This this is a so right here. What does that say? Yeah. Compile, but not download. This is going to compile and download, right? You understand? And then, of course, this is upload. Y'all know what? I need to put that in there too. Download means to do what? Send it to the PLC. Upload means what? Bring it from the PLC. Which is kind of strange. Now, this gives people problems because normally when you're on the internet and you get something, they say you want to download it, right? So that brings it from uh, the FTP server down to your computer. Uh, PLCs, though, considers themselves to be computers, right? So, uh, so y'all need to correct that. One shot is something we're going to have to look at today. A one shot is a digital device that when you energize it, it gives you one shot. So the output becomes true for one shot, and then it goes back what? False. So you can leave it true the rest of the time. It makes no difference. It gives you one shot on the output. To make you get another one shot, what would you have to do? You have to de-energize it first and then do what? Re-energize. So I knew that one, uh, that one, that one we need to understand because, uh, the, uh, when we look at the Allen Bradley field, uh, the Allen Bradley RS Logic 500 program, several, several of the ladder diagrams use one shots. Any more? I need to bring that up, so I need to make that correction. No, no. Uh, in RS, in the RS Logics, and, and y'all have access to the ladder diagrams, right? Uh, that's up on Blackboard. No, I printed out the tag sheet for you. I can't print. Oh, I I, I gave those out, but we're not going to take those off because that's a lot of paper now. You're more than welcome to print them out if you want to, uh, but they're up on the blackboard. So I think I think every one of them has uh, at least. Yeah, I think every one of them. I think every one of them has at least one shot. Uh, one one shot. In. They're pretty easy. Uh, one shots, uh, we can do it either on the, uh, the rising edge or the falling edge. So one of them would be when the contact that, or the control device that uh, energizes makes the run true. Uh, a one shot on the falling edge would be when the, when the run goes what? False. So JSR, we understand that, uh, flag, and there we go, OSR. So one shot rising. So that guy right there is only going to give us an output when this run right here becomes true. Because it's not going to, the output's not going to stay true, it's going to stay true for one shot, right? I think it's one scan cycle. You looked it up. 
Then we have a we have an OSRL, close to OSRL, volume, which means that you would get one shot. It would say true for one scan cycle when that wrong became false, and that's the true one shot for that. Right. Of course, we have that available in Siemens too. Well, I'm going to show y'all something new I found too, as far as the uh, yeah, Any more? So that's one shot. No, it's just going to be terms. But you need to know the definition. The definition should be inside the study the glossary. Okay. Yeah, that's why basic is going to be. It's going to be multiple choice or true false. Now we'll take it first. Any more questions? Are we okay? Are y'all okay on those? How did I spell compiler? Compiler. <laughs> And I, I'll, I'll blame it on spell check. I hate. I, I I hate it, but then I like it. The, the autocomplete that you have on your cell phone. Nancy Nancy tells a story about uh, her sending it to her sister. The autocomplete on the cell phone. It's a funny story. That was my niece. His niece. Her niece. <laughs> I'm recording. Uh, what I gave y'all out was the, uh, the wiring for Ethernet cables. Did I get the computer from there? I only have wires for the one. I'm okay. You should be okay right now. I gave you. You got access to Blackboard, right? The uh, I thought uh, I thought one of the versions that I had uh, of the uh, 1200 uh, manuals had the actual color scheme for the uh, for the Ethernet cables, but they don't. So that's why I gave y'all out this handout. These are standard uh, twisted pair cables. And why they're twisted pair cables? The amount of twist. And the spacing between the twists sets up inductors and sets up capacitors, which basically sets the characteristic impedance of the cable. So you just can't untwist these things for six inches and then hook it up to a connector and expect it to work correctly because you just screwed with the characteristics and impedance of the cable. So what we got here, basically, we're going to try to keep this uh, within a half inch. Now what we usually do is, uh, rule of thumb by the way, and we usually try to make sure when you run a cable, you want to you want to use uh, more than you actually need. Well, you say half inch rather than six. You mean that six inches is already out. Yeah, but what we do is we, we strip off six inches to make about six or four inches. So usually I do four inches, but I st about four inches. So we can unwrap the cable because if you get down in here, it's almost impossible to get unwrapped and it's almost impossible to get them straight and it's almost impossible to get them arranged correctly. So what we do is we strip off probably around four inches and then when we strip off four inches, then we can untwist them, right? You understand that? Then we can do, uh, then we can arrange them according to their correct order and then we can clip them off the right, the right length to put the connector now the connector that we use for Ethernet is called an RJ45 connector and it works exactly like the old connectors or the connectors that we used on wired telephones. Uh, the, the connectors that we used on wired telephones are RJ11s, these are RJ45s. RJ45s are, is an 8-pin connector. And these are crimp-on connectors. So we have to have a special tool that we use uh, to crimp them, and I'll show you that in a minute. And there's a uh, three. Does it work on to uh, fiber optic cables? 
Yeah, you know, well, they were run fiber. You never run fiber. Not, not in, not, not between PLCs that I know of, because that's just way too expensive for the speeds we're going to be communicating with anyway. There's no, there's no, there's no need to send billions of bits of information to a PLC. There's no machine that would need to respond that fast. It's just like you'll never, if you've got wired telephone, you'll never have fiber running to your house. You'll never have fiber run into your house for, for your, for your cable. It's always going to be wired media, right? Because there's no need for it. Uh, because even the bandwidth and compression we have now, your high definition TV still works fine running over coax. So what am I going to do? Am I going to run fiber into your house to not get any gains? That's like, that's like putting Z rated tires on a Volkswagen bug. Well, a fiber trunk, there's not going to be all fiber, it's going to be fiber trunks is what they're talking about. Yeah, but there's no no way. You, uh, U-verse uh, doesn't use, uh, U-verse uses DSL for one thing. Most of the time they try to do it through your phone lines. And that's called digital subscriber lines or DSL. They do a lot of compression because the telephone, the telephone system was never designed to handle data. It was designed to handle what? Uh, voice. So the bandwidth of the, of the twisted pair cables they use is nowhere near. Yeah. So what we have inside the cable is we have a strength member okay, uh, that we'll need to cut out. And when we when we strip the wire, we want to make sure we don't scribe the wire at all. You know what scribing means, right? Okay. So we have special cable strippers uh, that you'll use. You don't want to use a pocket knife to do this. And uh, you need to practice, You need to check it before you actually do stripping, because if it scribes the wire, which means cuts the insulation, then it means you're going to have to clip it off and start over. But you can see these guys have what adjustments on it so you can set it co correctly. Uh, we usually use the outside one, just put it on there, spin it around, and then move it back and forth, breaks it off and pull it off. Come back and bend the wire over looking for copper. If we don't see copper, we're okay. You understand that? Like that slip? These are called cable, these are called cable strips. Nice around, spin around and do what? Turn it back and forth, break it. And then uh, pull it off. We're okay. No, these were not Harbor Freight. We got these through Jamaco. I don't know if Harbor Freight has any cable strippers like this or not. I hadn't seen it inside their magazine that I did. Now, once we get it stripped, uh, what we do is, of course, we'll come up and we'll cut off the strength member uh, flush with the insulation. Now, uh, we're using what we call UTP cable. This is what we use commercial applications and home applications, which is unshielded twisted pair cable. Uh, we have another one, which is what y'all are using, that green cable. It's called STP. What do you think STP stands for? Shielded twisted pair. So inside, inside manufacturer and industrial applications where you have a lot of electromagnetic interference, then you'll need to use STP cable. And you'll look on the STP cable uh, you'll have a metal jacket that comes all the way out to about here where it snaps in. And then if you ever look at a, um, a, 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 a an industrial switch, an industrial Ethernet switch, it'll have a metal ring around the outside to make up that shield when you plug it in. Uh, we're not going to use the STP cable. Uh, we're going to use UTP cable because we're not in an environment here that needs that. But those green cables that y'all have that are so long, those are STP cables. So next time you get them, look up and look at the connector, and you'll see the metal shield runs down to where it actually plugs into the uh, to the RJ45 jack. Now once we got it out, so I've got about four inches stripped off, uh, then the next thing we'll do is what? We'll untwist it, and we'll untwist it all the way down to the jacket. Okay. And then once we twist it, uh, then what uh, I usually do, I don't have the strip tool here. Now, 
Uh, we have two methods we can hook these things up with. We have what we call the T586A and the T586B. Y'all see that on the handout I gave you? 68. Did I say it? It is 68. And what they do is they give you the color codes. So the B is orange, white, orange, green, white, blue, brown, white, brown, going from pin one. So if we look at the connector, we hold it face, we hold it with the pin, pins facing up. Pin one is on the left. So the color code will go orange, white, orange, green, white, blue, brown, white, brown, right? I'm sorry. Orange, white, orange, green, white, blue, blue, white, brown, blue, white, brown, brown, white, brown. Uh, now that's the B connector, right? The A connector, what do they do? Well, they roll the green pair with the orange pair. Y'all see that? Now, to make a straight, what we call a straight through cable. Now, we have two, two types of equipment we hook up to on our internet. We have what we call data terminal equipment, and we have data communication equipment. Why would you think computers would be considered? You know, they terminal. They, they, terminal equipment is where your transmitter is going to be a DTE and your receiver of the information, final receiver of the information is going to be a DTE. Printers are DTEs, right? You understand? Anything the information flows through, any addressable device that it flows through to get between your DTEs, we call those DCEs, which are data communication. That makes sense. Now, if I'm going from a DTE to a DCE, we use a straight-through cable. If I'm going to hook a computer to a computer, which are two DTEs, we have to create what we call a crossover cable. That makes sense. Now, industry standard for straight-through uh, straight, uh, straight cables is to wire both ends of the cables using the 568B connection. To make a crossover cable, which we're going to have to make, why is that? Because we're going to hook a computer to a computer, and we're going to have to make what we call a crossover cable. So why would you think, how would you make a crossover cable? You'll, fire, you'll wire one to the B, and you'll wire the other one to the A, right? Does that make sense? Everybody okay? So that's what we're going to do uh, in our team. So what we do... Once I get it out, uh, normally what I use, and so this is the crimp tool. Uh, this this does RJ11s and RJ45s. Uh, the one we have most of them does just RJ45s, which is the 8-pin connector. Uh, the RJ11s that you have on your phone, that's a 6-pin connector. It's a lot smaller. And this guy here pretty much has, has almost everything you need. Uh, no, this one, I don't like that. So this one does about everything you need. This should uh, be, I don't, know if, uh, I don't know if that'll work. I don't know if it's adjusted right now. Y'all might want to check this. So it's got a cable stripper on it. Then it's got a wire. Yeah. It's got a, a cut. It doesn't, it doesn't adjust vertical. All it does looks like it's just horizontal. But it looked like it, it looked like it's going to work. And then this is the, uh, this is the, uh, crimper for the RJ45 connector. So what I like to do is just lay it uh, across this handle and just pull it through until I can get them as straight as I can get them. Then I come up and arrange them. What's the B? Yeah, so I'll come up here and move them around, get them out of the twist. I'm going to go orange, white. And then I'm, what comes next? Orange. See that? Okay, I'm going to arrange them. Then I'm going to go white. Green, white, blue. Wait. I'm doing this. Let me get this out of here. 
Now, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to maintain the twist to no more than a half inch, not even a half inch, I'm sorry, about a quarter inch. Orange white, orange. These guys are all things up. Green, white, blue, right? Blue, white, green. Brown, white, brown. Now, once I get them in order, it's in a twist, guys. I need to rearrange this. Sorry, one more. And that's why we don't want to cut them off so short because you're going to have to do what? You know, arrange them so you can get them closed. But what you need to do is have this. So look. See, I don't want to cooperate. Orange, white, orange, green, white, blue. Blue, white, green, brown, white, brown. Now, the only two wires, uh, the only two pair that's actually used is the orange, white, orange, and the green, white, blue. Uh, the other ones in the Siemens is connected to ground. This basically helps. So we got them in the order, orange, white, orange, green, white, blue, blue, white, green, brown, white, brown. I got them in the order I want to get them in, right? Everybody okay? And then I'm going to come over here. I got about a quarter inch up there. And then here we got the blade on there that's going to cut it straight across. You see that? And I'm going to come in here and lay them in there. And then I'm going to come up here and I'm going to cut them. I'm not going to let go of these things. I got them in the right order. Orange, white, orange, green, white, blue, blue, white, green, brown, white, brown. And I'm going to take my connector, right? Pin one is to the watt, to the left. I'm going to come up here and start pushing it in. Pin one's to the left. Y'all understand this? I'm going to push this in. I'm going to make sure the jacket goes under its crimp. So here's the jacket crimp right here. I'm going to push it in until it does that right. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to look at the front. And I should see eight little copper dots pointing at me right there. Can y'all see them? Okay, so that means it's all the way up against. It's flush to the end. I have my jacket under the crimp. you see what I'm talking about? Yes or no? I double check my order, orange, white, orange, green, white, blue, blue, white, green, brown, white, brown. I'm going to come up here. I'm going to insert it into my crimp. Okay. So this, this is the blade that's going to crimp the jacket. These are the fingers that's going to come up here and crimp these pins. So the pins are actually extended out a little bit. And when we crimp it, it's going to do what? Push them in. It's going to actually pierce the insulator. Okay, we're going to come over here, and you got to come up here, guys. you got to press it pretty hard, right? You understand that? Everybody okay? Then we should be able to pull it out. There we go. And what you just did is we made a 568B. If we're going to make a straight-through cable, what would we put on this side? Another B. Huh? What's, what do you mean? What is, what is it called? This is called an RJ45 connector. We're making an Ethernet cable. What's that? No, don't make any difference. Because what it does is it rolls the transmit and receive. So if I use the green, white, and green, that's the receive. Well, what it's going to do is this guy's going to be transmitting on orange, white, orange. It's going to roll over and go into the receive on the other guy. What if I swap the cable, right? Well, this guy's going to be transmitting on orange, white, orange. This guy's going to be receiving on the, uh, it's going to be receiving, right, on the other pair. It don't matter which way you plug the cable in, a crossover cable. 
Now, if I was going to go from a computer to a switch, y'all understand what a, what's a switch. So originally when we set up, uh, so the way we connect a network is called the topology. And we have, we have uh, three basic topologies. We have what we call a bus topology. We have what we call a star topology. And we have what we call a ring topology. Ring. So a ring topology, what we do is we, we take the computers, the computers will have an in and an out, an in and an out, an in and an out, and we take the out of the first one, feed it to the in, out, in, out, in, and the last one we would bring it back into the end of the first one. So those suckers are just in a ring, right? You understand? And what they do is they pass a token. It's a token passing network. So what they do is uh, these computers grab the token, if they don't need to send any information, they send it to the next computer, the next computer, the next computer, the next computer, and, next computer, and the token's just doing what? Well. But I need to send information. Well, when the token comes around to me, I hold the token. I transmit my packet. Nobody else can transmit it at the same time because they don't have the what? They don't have the token. I transmit a packet, I release the token. Then, then if it comes back around, nobody grabs it. When it comes back to me, I send the next packet. So networks are usually what we call packet switching networks. So if I'm if you're downloading a, a, a gigabyte file from the internet, you don't get access to the internet for that whole file. You're just doing it in one. Packets. So you get a packet, you release the network. Somebody else needs it, they grab it. If they nobody else needs it, then you can get another packet. That's the way networks work. Because that way everybody gets a shot at the one, at the network, and that's the way they work. So even token ring, uh, bus topology, you run a common link between all your machines. So, so the amateur line is using a bus topology over there. It's using what we call a daisy chain bus topology. We have two. We have what we call a drop line topology, where you want a bus topology, where you run one cable and then you put taps into the cable and, and do down what they call down drop. Which is basically what cable TV is. Right? Well, what's that? No, B is transmit and receive. The orange white orange pair is the transmit wire. The green white green is the receive wires. I mean, if I go, if I'm going to transmit, uh, Brian, I need to do a uh, I need to receive, right? So B, the B connection is what we call a straight foot through cable. This is, to, this is, we use the B connection if we're connecting a DTE to a DTE. We use a, I'm sorry, we use a straight through cable if we're connecting a DTE to a DCE. We use a crossover cable if I'm connecting a DTE to a DTE, a computer to computer. Did I say that right? I don't think I did. Computer to computer is a crossover cable. Computer to other device would be a straight cable, straight through cable. Did I say it right that time? So D. TE to DTE, we use a crossover cable. DTE to DCE, we use a straight through cable. DCE to DCE, we use a straight through cable. Am I saying that right? D, DTE to DTE, we use a crossover cable. DTE to DCE or DCE to DCE, we use a straight through cable. So that means I take my computer and I go over there and hook it up to that switch that's on that. I, I can't use the cable y'all made because we're going to make crossover cables. And we're going to make them a lot shorter so y'all don't have to deal with those big old green cables anymore, right? You don't understand that. But over there, when we get over there and we set up our network, we're going to set up a, a star topology. So a star topology, 
what we have on a, a, tar, a star topology is we uh, have a central device, used to be called a hub. But the way the hub would work is the hub would take the information from a computer and transmit it all out all of its output. So the big disadvantage of that was only one computer could be on the entire subnet at one time. Y'all understand subnets? We talked about this in class. So we have a network. And then we've got all these computers on our network and we got one guy that's broadcasting the information and nobody else can broadcast while they're broadcasting right so it became obvious real real fast that they needed to break a large network down into smaller networks we call the smaller networks we call them subnets then what we do is part of the ip address we identify a we have what we call a network id and then we have a node id or computer id and we we tell it how we split that up it's something that we call a subnet mask so a subnet mask identifies what portion of the ip address is the network id the subnet id and what part of that address is the actual computer on that subnet. So what we can do is we can duplicate computer addresses if they're on a different one subnet. So the last digits of my my phone number is uh, 2311. How many phones in the United States do you think has the last four digits of 231? How many? Okay, so how do how do we split them up? Well, we put them in subnet. The area code would be a what? A subnet, right? You understand. And that's so the first part, the most significant digits of an IP address is the network ID or the subnet, right? It's on. The last part is the computer on that network. Does that make sense? So to identify, to tell, to tell our routers and everything what part, what portion is the network ID. And what portion is the computer ID? We use something called a subnet map. Now, most people don't understand that because when you go in and you, when you connect to your internet service provider, they use what they call dynamic IPs, which means your computer, your computer automatically says, when you come online, it says, Hey, I need an IP address. It sends out a packet to what we call a DHCP server, a DHCP server sees that request right from your mac address and then says okay this ip address is free and it sends all this information to your computer it sends your ip it sends your dns servers it sends the gateways it automatically does what configures your computer so if you got a wireless router at your house it is a dhcp server so every time you log into it it's going to give your computer what an ip address it's going to give your computer a subnet mask it's going to give your computer a DNS address, and it's going to give your computer a, a, a gateway address. And in that way, you can communicate not only with computers on your network, you can also communicate with computers on the Internet. So what does a gateway do? We've already talked about that. Sort of. We, we could have a gateway with inside a network. A network uh, gateway converts protocols. So Ethernet is a baseband network. The Internet is a broadband network. They do not communicate using the same modulation techniques. They don't work. So if I'm going to connect to the Internet, I cannot take this network and connect it to the Internet because this guy is using uh, broad base. The internet uses broad broadband, right? You understand? Or use, we use baseband, so it has to go through a lot. It has to go through a gateway, and it converts protocols for you. So a gateway converts protocols. So if I've got one network running IPX, SPX, I got one running WINS, I got one running NetBuoy, we can connect those networks together using what? A gateway. 
So it converts network. What does a router do? This is the kind of stuff y'all gonna have to deal with, guys. This is the kind of stuff because we're dealing with industry 4.0, and 4.0 means everything's connected together. If we're connecting together, we have to have the ability to understand how we network, right? So what does a router do? Well, what it does is it looks at the it looks at the network ID. So a router is going to have multiple ports coming out the back of it. Okay, you understand. And when a packet comes in, if the packet belongs to that subnet, the router does nothing. If my IP address specifies a different subnet, then the router it comes into the subnet, and depending on the on the subnet ID, it routes it out one of those connectors out the back of your computer, out the back of that router. So we have a wireless router, but no people. We you, you go up there and you hook up one computer to each output. Well, what you're doing is you're putting one computer on each subnet. And if you looked at the IP address, you'd see each one of them's got a basically a small little section that's different. You can hook up thousands of computers. Well, that's not true. Uh, most routers use what we call a Class C subnet, which means you could have 256 computers on each one of those plugs on the back of your router. And what do you usually hook up? One. But you could hook up 256. Most most of them have uh, four ports right there. That's 1,024 computers you could hook up to your to your home just strictly by going through a, a switch. So you take it out and go through a switch. So a router does that. It it selects a what? Subnet. And we identify the subnet as part of the what? The IP. The IP uses something called a subnet mask where we can identify where the uh, where the route IP and the uh, computer IP goes. Oh, so I'm going to go to control panel. And we can see this, by the way. Uh, we can look at all this information. So one thing they uh, allow us, and this is still available even on Windows 10, uh, you might have to search for it on Windows 10, but it's part of your accessories. And then you can go to command prompt. And then the command. So this is this is what we used to deal with, by the way. DOS. This is the DOS. They call it command prompt. So this is what you got when you, these com uh, computers, the first operating systems that we used were text-based operating systems. So when you booted boot the computer, you got this thing right here with just a little blinking. You'll see the little cursor blinking. Up, up, waiting on a what? Waiting on a command. And now you're dealing with syntax. So uh, so the the uh, IP config, that's the TCP IP command for looking at the configuration for your IP on your computer. And I can hit this. And it shows me all the addressable devices. This is my, uh, so this is my IPv6, uh, this is my IPv6 IP address, this is my IPv4 address, this is my subnet map, and this is the gate map. So how did my computer get all that information? How did what? How did it get all that information? Well, we have this set up. Uh, if we go into a control panel, And then we go, by the way, I, I like mine big, I like mine small, so I go to small icons up there. Don't do that, it puts you in blue. It's a lot easier for me to find. Here's network and sharing. Uh, then I'm going to come up here and uh, go to my adapter. And then my wireless adapter, which is guys connected. And then right down here I can go to what? Properties. And then these are all the uh, uh, drivers. And then I'm going to go down to IPv4 because we're on a private network. And I have set mine up for what is it say? Spain and IP address automatically. We call this dynamic IP. 
And I'm also telling this to obtain a DNS server address for your call and address. And I'll tell you how you can get a DNS server for your call and address. So what happens when this computer comes on the network, it sends out a packet, just fly it's a it's a it's a it's a routable packet, it goes everywhere, it's a special packet it sends out. And it's looking for a server that's it's looking for a computer running what we call DHCP services. That's DHCP services keeps up with all the free IP addresses and everything that your computer needs to know. Your computer asks for this to occur, and then the DHCP server automatically sends all this information back to your computer, and it does what? It sets up the IP address for you. If I come over here and do this, uh, this is static IPs. So that's what you're doing on on these PLCs. You're setting up static IPs. You you went in there and entered the what the IP address. So you're setting up static IPs. Something the problem with dynamic IPs is that my DHCP server only keeps a list on that IP address for a certain amount of time, and and whoever sets up the server can establish that. So your ISP your internet service provider has basically if you log off. That IP is free again, right? You understand. So uh, these big ISP, uh, these internet service providers, they might have millions of clients, but they realize that all those clients are not going to be on at the same time. So they're not going to pay for a million IP addresses when they only have so many IPs that's in, available. So as soon as you log off from an internet service provider, what do they do? They free up your IP. The next person that logs in is going to get your IP. And so, if I wanted to address your computer, I could not do it by IP address. So these guys over here, we don't want their IPs to change, right? We don't want them to move around because we go over there and turn off that line, right? You understand? And then we leave it off for a certain amount of time, depending on how long they, how long the DHCP server is set up to reserve those IPs. Then I got a different IP. Now my now my HBI panel don't work anymore because it don't know where the PLCs are because we we're using we're using uh, Dynamic IPs. Does that make sense? So if I go to static IPs, then you you got to assign an IP address to your computer, and you just can't randomly pick an IP address because uh, we have this happens every once in a while. Uh, people will do static IPs, and the first time it says it says you have an IP complex, which means what? So we have our own route. Uh, we we've been we've been dealing with networking. Probably longer than the college has, so they let us get by with a lot of stuff that the other departments don't get by with. We have our own DNS server, and we have our own route. So, 172.80. something. So that's our route. So we have that whole that uh, we have all those addresses available to us that we can use. But you just can't pick one unless you're setting up the network. If you're setting up the network, if you're setting up private network, you can do what. Yeah, all you need to do is you just use the range of private addresses. And, and private addresses, by the way, use IPv4 because we don't need IPv6 on a private network. So we okay. So my computer set up for dynamic IP. Uh, if you want to see everything, everything, including the DNS servers, uh, then what you do is you uh, uh, TLS. By the way, clears the screen. I'm gonna put IP config. I'm gonna put slash all, and then this should tell us everything about every device. So notice it gives us our DHCP server. It gives us our uh, DNS servers. It gives us everything about the whole total setup. So how do you get there? Just go IP config. Uh, first of all, you go to command prompt, right? You understand. Uh, Windows, uh, Windows 10, I don't think it's one of your items. Uh, so what you do is just search for it in the search uh, bar. Just type uh, control panel. I've made, it, I've made it one of my shortcuts. Just search for control panel and then find your network settings. Are we okay? So what a router does is a router looks at the IP address. So what what IPs are we setting up up there? We're setting up static, but we're using what 
dot one six eight dot I don't think it's eight five. I think I'll make any of them. And then we're doing numbers over here. I think y'all started with three or something like that, right? Are we okay. Now this is what we call it. This this is what we call a class C. So a class C would automatically use a subnet map mass of this. And now the zeros identifies the computer address. And then this right here would identify the network. We can't. Zeros in the subnet mass identifies the computer ID. Ones in the subnet mass identifies the network ID. But you so you'll never have zeros inside in, inside here. I'm sorry. So this would be the subnet mass like this. So if we wrote it out in binary, that's what it would look like. Well, these guys right here, uh, this is what we call the node ID, which means a computer or it could be a switch. So just about everything, any switches have IP addresses, gateways have IP addresses. If we're going to address anything on a TCP IP, everything, that's at, everything that does something has to have an IP address, right? Uh, these right here identify uh, the network. So to understand subnet mass, you got to be able to go to binary. You got to understand binary. Now, I, this would be an illegal subnet mass because what I've done is I've stuck a zero into a bit that's identified as a what? As a network ID. So what you do is you start with ones and go this way. That's your network ID or address, pardon. And then we start here and go this way. This is your node address. That makes sense. So I could have a zero right here, right? You understand? That would be part. That would make it. But what they've done is they've split it into what we call uh, classes. We have a class A, a class B, and a class C. Uh, so a class A, uh, uh, a class A subnet mass would be this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So that means one, two, three, four, I see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eight, twenty-four. So I could have two to the twenty-fourth computers on a subnet. A class C. So a class C is two five five. I mean a class A would be two five five dot zero dot zero dot zero. That would be a subnet mass for a class A. A class B would be 255.255.0.0. That's class B. Huh? Right? And that would be A. So that would be 2 to the 16th. That would be, six, so we could have 65,536 computers on a subnet for a class B. A class C, the subnet mass is this. So that means that's eight bits. So that's two to the eight. We could have 256 computers. Technically, we could have 256 computers uh, on a class C subnet. But but some of the IPs are are dedicated. Like one is usually your gateway. Then you have zero, which is usually for troubleshooting. So you can't you don't get access to all of the 256 addresses. 
So that'd be something you'd have to actually research. So if I if I assign a class, so that 192, if it starts off with 192, 192, if it starts with 192, that's a class C that's designated the class C private address. It would automatically use this subnet number, but it don't mean you got to use it. You can come back and use the change. It's just that if you don't specify a subnet mask, it, that's what it uses because it considers 192 to be a class C IP address. That makes sense. So what your routers are going to look at, your routers look in here. So your your actually route ID is set in here on your IP address, starting from here in your network. That would be what your router uses. Now this would be your main network ID. So you look at the internet, uh, those are you'd have to figure those out, but we're just going to look at what we call private IPs. What's private IPs? Private IPs are IPs that are never intended to go out on the internet. If one of them actually gets out there, it's non-routable. It won't go anywhere. It's a dead IP address. But we can use them as private IPs, right? You understand? So this college, I think, I think the whole college has, we used to have two. I don't know if we still got two. Uh, I think we got I know we got at least one internet IP. And it's a 207. It's a it's a it's a legal internet IP. That all this makes sense. That just makes sense. So y'all learn a little bit about subnet mass, DNS, what's DNS? Used to uh, in, uh, the, the, what I what I use uh, for analogy is your I had a guy call me one day wanting to know my son. I didn't have my phone with me. Wanting to know my son's phone number. I have no idea what my son's phone number is. Because why? Got I got it in my contact list. So that's DNS right there. So what DNS does, it allows us to address computers by name instead of by IP address, right? But what I have to do when I, when I call him, I have to go to my contact list and select his name. So what a DNS server does, it allows us to assign names to computers. And what the DNS server does, it matches the name to the actual IP address. That's all it does. That's all it does. So we have a DNS server over here. Uh, so as soon as I, as soon as I assign a name, uh, uh, since we, de since we designate a DNS server, if I, if I come up and bring up a new computer, I come up here, I assign it a name, right? You understand. And then I assign an IP. As soon as I do that, it goes out there and, and registers that on the DNS server. Once that's registered on the DNS server, I come up here and type in a name. It don't deal with IPs. It's sent to the what? The DNS server. The DNS server does what? Finds the IP that matches that. And then from then on, it's IP address, which is what we need. So all the DNS server is a domain, do, domain naming server. And allows us to use what? Give give a give a node a name instead of it. Wouldn't that be? Ain't that neat? So now you can address Facebook.com. Facebook.com's got a got a IP address. You don't need to know Facebook. They used to. The old browsers used to pop up the IP down on the status bar down. It was really neat. And then once you learn the IP, you could address it with IP, and it was a little faster because it did, to make the connection because you didn't have to go through uh, the DNS server. The browsers don't do that anymore. And, DN, and the dark web don't use DNS servers. They, if you if you're going to get into the dark web, you got to know the what. You got to know the IP address of that server. You got to know it, and they move them too. So what they'll do is they'll assign an IP address. If they don't get any conflicts, they do what? They use it until they get a conflict, and then they'll reassign it. So uh, those the dark wheels move away. And they'll do that. They'll change the IP on those things too. So, so uh, what we do on a, a star topology is we have a center unit, and then all the computers plug into that center unit. Originally, we used something called a hub. A hub was just a repeater. That's all it was. 
So what was happening was when this computer wanted to transmit something, if we used a hub, what would happen is that that data or that packet would do what? It would go out and go out all the other branches. And then what they finally realized is there's got to be a way, better way. Uh, so they came up with what we call a switch. So now we use switches. When I connect a device up to a switch and it starts saying I'm on here, what the switch does is it memorizes the computer's, it registers the computer's MAC address. And what's the MAC address? No, that's the IP address. What's the MAC address? So IP addresses are logical addresses. What is logical address? A uh, logical address is just software. And software can be what? Change. So I can leave this, I can take this computer on, I can leave it plugged in for a week, unplugged for a week, I can come back in here and I get a different IP address because IP addresses are logical addresses. They're not, they're not, they're not physical addresses. Right? Don't understand that. A MAC address is the physical address of the device. It's a 48-bit binary number. It is the physical address of the device. That address is put into that device when it is manufactured. Uh, the first 24 bits identifies the manufacturer, the most significant bits. The second 24 bits addresses a device. But if you think about it, we have two to the 48 devices out there. And I, hope, I don't think we'll ever run out of that. So what's two to the forty-eight? So once uh, once once the guy once the manufacturer uses all its two to the twenty-four, it asks for another manufacturing ID. So you'll see different manufacturers have a couple of MAC at, MAC addresses that they assign. But the first twenty-four bits will always be the the same for that for that license, right? You understand? Then the next twenty-four bits are there. So when I look at uh, this and you can find this on your cell phone guys uh, here's the mac address for this card right here and it does it in hexadecimal puts it off with dashes a4-3a-4b-a-7-6-7 how many devices in the world has that mac address one this is physically built into the car. These are managed by, by ICANN uh, or the Internet Authority of uh, these. Uh, so before I can put a car, legally make a card, I have to get a range of, of MAC addresses. These are the physical addresses of the device. So eventually it comes to a physical address. So what my switch does is when I turn my computer on, when I turn my computer on and it connects to the address, and it sends out these packets identifying itself. It says, hey, I'm available. What your switch does is it grabs these MAC addresses out of that packet and saves them. Then when I come up here and I transmit a packet, what I do is I come over here and say, I want to go to this computer over here. It takes my MAC address, right, compares it to another MAC address, and only sends it to that computer. So what it does, what a switch does, it's a computer to a computer connection. And all of the devices on the switch does not see anything. So as long as I'm not trying to communicate with another computer that's already being communicated with, the switch will not have, will, will connect me through. So what the switch did, it increased the speed of the network by magnitude. The old hub, when I broadcast, nobody else on my entire subnet could do what? They could broadcast. They couldn't. They couldn't do it until I until my packet was gone. But with a switch, I could send mine to this guy. You could send your stuff to that guy. But as long as we don't try to do it, communicate with the same computer, we don't have any problem. If we don't, they just if it, if we do, it just waits on the other computer to become free. So switches are computers. They have a they, hubs had no I address. They had no IP address. They had no intelligence. All they did was all they did was receive. They were called receivers. Some of them was actually what we call passive. They actually just ran wires. <laughs> uh, 
after a while they become active, which means you had to plug them in, and they became repeaters, which means uh, once we exceeded the length of a cable, we, if we ran through a hub, it would do what? It would give us that length again. So what we do is we take uh, these uh, these uh, switches, and then we hook these to what? We hook these to routers. What does the router do? It splits us up into what? Subnets. So we can have really, really large networks. So your gateway on your network, people don't understand gateway, that's your modem. Everybody understand that? And what's a modem? It's a modulator demodulator. And what it does is it takes what baseband on your local network and converts it over to broadband for the internet. What's the difference between baseband and broadband? Oh, but what's the difference? <laughs> Everybody know the difference between baseband? Well, you hear broadband all the time because that's what the internet uses. And then what's another term they use all the time? <coughs> bandwidth. So what's bandwidth? Sort of. What's media? Um. No, it's a good guess, but no, it's not. Uh, all our all our networks are digital. They're they're digital. Period. Period. Uh, we don't do any analog transmission on networks. They're all digital. So what is media? If you don't understand media, you don't understand bandwidth. Uh, bandwidth uh, media is what information flows through. So what 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 band, what medium am I using now? No, I'm using air. Good guess. So, uh, media is what information flows through. So right now I'm using air. Right. Modulating the air with my, I'm modulating the air. So modulation is when we take something and place it on top of something, right? So what am I doing? What am I doing? I'm modulating the air. So my vocal cords are vibrating according to what vein is causing the air to modulate and then your ears are picking that up. So modulation is when we take the information we're trying to send, place it on another frequency that we call a carrier. What, oh, I'm sorry, what information? Thank you. The technical definition is it uh, makes it compatible with the media. Uh, 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 we call this a carrier. And it's real neat the way they do it. So the modulation we use in, uh, in uh, digital, we call them ASK, PSK, FSK, amplitude shift, PSK shift. So what we do is we, we have a carrier and then we let bits, ones and zeros, ride on that carrier, which is, which is really neat. So you'll hear a term called baud ray. Baud is the, basically the frequency of the carrier. Used to, 
uh, we send one bit per baud. So used to when we said 9600 baud, uh, that would be 9600 bits per second. But now what they do is they modulate it using something called quadrature amplitude modulation. And it lets multiple bits right on the same care, right, right on the same baud. Does that make sense? Uh, so if you're doing 9600 bits per second and you, if you could put four bits on each baud, then that would be 9600 times four. That would be like 3800 bits per second that you could put on a single baud, right? You know so modulation is when we place information on another frequency that we call a watt, a carrier. So that's what they do when, on your radio stations, is they place all that voice and all that music, they place that on a carrier. And then what you have the ability to do is you tune your radio to a watt, to a carrier. And then it comes in go, doing, do, using filtering circuits. It's real easy, guys. We just strip the carrier off. And once we get rid of the carrier, now we got the watt. Now we got the information. But they have to modulate the left and right channels. So it's really, really neat, uh, all the modulation they go through, because uh, we, we we ride the left channel on one carrier, we ride the, or the right uh, channel on another carrier. We we put both of those on a, mod, on a, on a main carrier, so it comes into your radio. It strips off the main carrier, which is the station you've got. Then it splits. Then it splits your left and right watt up according to what it's met. And then they strip off those carriers. Uh, you think about video. Video. You have you have color carriers. You have red, green, blue color carriers. You have uh, voice. Now we're sending stereo over video. Over video. All those are placed on carriers, and then all those are placed on a what? Another carrier. That's just pretty. But using filtering, what can we do? We, we, we have a frequency, we have a filter, we can use a band pass, a pass filter, we can strip off the carrier and then let the information come through. Then we can have another filter and, and strip off those carriers and finally get down to the actual information. And that's what, I, and then of course, eventually if I modulate it, what do I need to do? So what's demodulation? Removing the information from the carrier, right? So we use these devices called modulators, demodulators. C A R I E R. And we, we, what do we call those for short? Modems. They got a modem, a cable mode. Those are modulator demodulators. Basically, they're, they're the gateways. But people know them as modems. Why? Because if you came up through dial up, you had to convert computer over to the phone system. We went through modems. So now when they do the same thing on your cable TV, instead of calling them cable gateways, they call them what? Modems. So a modem is a modulator demodulator. So what it does is it takes your digital information, converts it over to, uh, puts it on a carrier, using some modulation frequency, places that on the internet using broadband instead of baseband. So baseband, the way baseband works is that you only have one device on your subnet at any time. One device. That's the way baseband works. So right now, who's on who's on the network? Well, nobody's on the network. I'm not sending information across the network. People think that your computer's on the network all the time. It's not. It's just sat there listening. Uh, so Ethernet uses something called carrier sense multiple access with uh, right. baseband. One computer on the subnet at a time. One computer. So Ethernet is the base. Ethernet is base band. So how many computers are, are on the internet right are on the network right now in this class? None. If you're not saving information, if you're not addressing the internet, if you're just doing stuff on your computer, you're not on the net. You're not connect. You're on your computer's listening to the network, but you're not trying to put packets on the network. 
So baseband works out really well, especially if you have few computers. It's really, really fast. Because what you do on baseband, if you if there's no other computers on the network, you get the entire bandwidth of the media. So if you're on a gigabit network and you're the only computer on there, by George, you get a gigabit. And you're sending your packets like this, right? You understand? If somebody else wants it, then you drop off and wait on the network to become free. So the more computers that's on the network, the slower it goes. That's baseband. The less computers, the faster it goes. What they do on broadband is they take the bandwidth of the media and they split it into little cells. So if you was using a media that had 100 megabits worth of bandwidth, then maybe we could do 10 sales, but each person would only get what? One megabit. Now what they do on the cable, of course, is they come up here and shell, they sell you two. So they can give you different what? Transfer speeds. Normally if you upgrade, you have to pay, they give you one speed, it's part of your cable bill, right? You understand? They say it's free, but you, if it was free, you wouldn't have to pay, right? And then if you add more, then they give you more sales. What's nice about this is that you're almost guaranteed to have access to the network, but you don't get total, you don't get the total bandwidth of the network. That's broadband. So broadband, you can have a lot of people on the network at the same time, but nobody gets what? The full bandwidth. So which one's better? Broadband's good because you're just about guaranteed access. Uh, on a private network, probably baseband is better because normally you're not sharing a lot of bandwidth. Because why? There's all, there's very few computers on your subnet at the same time. And that's where we're splitting up with, uh, with switches and routers really come into play. It's really, really fast on a private network. On the subnet. Or basically, we, that used to be the definition, but it would probably be more likely on the switch. You know, if you're using, if you're using, if you're using a bus topology, then it's going to be on the network. If you're using a star topology, and you're using switches instead of hubs, then that that's really fast going between. Them. So baseband, broadband, y'all probably hadn't heard of baseband because most people don't deal with what's actually going on on the private network, right? You understand? Most people, you, when you're dealing with, you're dealing with uh, the internet. So, you know, if you got a home computer and you got a little router, you're communicating between your two computers, which y'all should do too, you know, y'all can share printers on that thing. You can have one printer on one computer and everybody in your house can do what? Print to it. You can. You can share capacity, drive capacity. You can share all kind of things. So you can map them and share them. So I leave one of my computers at home connected to the VPN at the college all the time, basically. And I don't need to connect my other one. I just can do what transfer it through the one that's already, already, uh, already connected. So Ethernet uses what they call carrier sense multiple access collision detection. So basically what your network card does is it before it transmits a packet, it listens to the network. If nobody's on there, it sends out a packet. If somebody's on there, then what does your what does your network card do? Waits. Comes off for a random amount of time, goes back and checks again. Random amount of time, check again. Random amount of time, check it again. Uh, the problem we have is the longer the network, the uh, and what happens when, when your card puts the data out there, it's also receiving it back. So what it's doing is, is comparing what it's going out as port and gets what's coming back, right? You understand that? So what happens if two guys happen to come on the network at the same time, then the data that it's transmitted gets garbled, right? We call that a collision. And so what Ethernet will do is, both cards will back off. Both cards detect the collision, or all parties involved detect the collision, 
it comes off, uh, generates a random number, and then comes back on at a round, uh, after a random time. And that's called carrier sense multiple access with collision detection is what Ethernet means. So that way it's a very cheap way to do it. It's down and dirty, right? You understand that. And if you don't have collisions, you're okay. If you do have collisions, then, uh, and if something happens and you don't do your cables right, you'll get garbled at a lot, and your computer's going to be really slow because it's going to keep coming off, right, until the, the data transfer. So making your cables correctly is very, very important. So we don't want we don't want to get out of the twist. We want to maintain this twist for about what's that? About a quarter inch, right? You understand that? And then we, when we plug this in, they're doing the same thing on the other side. So that's about a half an inch that they allow in a, in a, between a, that and the switch or whatever. And if you, if you make that too long, and if, uh, the biggest problem we have is people, don't, don't see what I'm talking about. The biggest problem we have is when people crimp it, they don't get that jacket under the crimp for the jacket. You understand what I'm talking about, yes or no? So see how far my jacket goes up in here? You need to make sure it gets below this indention right here. Because if you don't do that, then all the stress on the cable is on those crimps that's on your wire. <laughs> right? You understand that? And if somebody jerks on it, what it'll do, it'll just pull right out. Uh, by the way, uh, we do have, we don't, we're not going to let y'all do it, but we, we can put boots on this thing. Uh, anybody remember the telephone system? What happened all the time? That little that little snap right there that held it in would do what all the time, right? Uh, so we do have boots that we can put over this that basically just covers this tip to keep it from getting hung on things and break off. So that, on the on the green cables, you saw the boot that was out there. Uh, we're not going to do that on this. So what we're going to do is we're going to let your team. Well, I think we got one team that's got three. So the team that's got three, what we'll let you do is just build one side of the cable. So what we want you to do is one of your team members, uh, we want them to do the five, uh, the 568A. The other team member will do the one, the B. Everybody okay? Uh, we'll make the cables. By the way, there is no specified length for a cable. Some people say uh, at least four feet to keep reflection. I've seen them shorter than that, uh, especially if you're going between a DTE and a, I mean, sorry, a DTE and a DTE. So let's make ours, uh, what would this be, total length? If we leave four inches on each side, that's about what? About five feet, so let's make about five feet. Okay, everybody okay? Y'all ready? I just set myself up the <laughs> Okay, so cables down here, crimp tools are down here. Uh, here's the cable strippers. Here's the RJ45 connectors. Better diagrams for your station and see if we got any questions about any of the commands that's out there. So on Blackboard, hopefully some of y'all have been out there already, under PC Manual, <laughs> I'm sorry, under Festo MPS RA Plug 500 Lighter Diagrams. Everybody knows what station y'all working on, right? So I'm not going to look at the... Uh, I'm not going to look at the distribution station because I'm the one that did that. So what we have is we have the RS Logic programs for each module. So this is the testing station. Oh, I wanted to I wanted to show y'all something. 
that I just found out. So you remember on RS logics, uh, I don't think y'all did this in the intro to PLCs unless you had me, is that you can bring down a little square that's got every command on there. And if you know if you know the mnemonic for each look, each command, instead of trying to go through that scroll box up there, you could just go in and select that. What they did on uh, on the Tia portal. And I don't know if uh, the S7, if the S7 does that or not. So this is technically still S7, which is what what uh, PLC, what uh, Stevens calls their uh, programming application. Uh, so we call this the t S. Technically, this is S7 semantics, not Siemens semantics. S7 Tia portal version 14. Up until now, they just called it Step Seven. So that's their programming application. So of course, with the with the TIA, a total integrated package, what do they do? Well, they they put all those different applications in what in one program, which is really really. Neat. So I'm playing around with the analog inputs and high speed counters. And I'll try to show you all that before we get here. The the counters that we use in in a, in a, ah the uh, the counters that we used in uh, in intro to PLCs, these are software counters, which means they're implemented by programmers. The advantage that hardware has over software is hardware is always a lot faster because it's done electronically. If you ever looked at the program, the machine language program that did counting, it's going to be a pretty complicated program. And it takes probably milliseconds or, or to actually run through a counter. There's a lot of applications, especially on uh, high speed encoders where we used to, to uh, establish position and speed where those counters just can't keep up with that. So what PLCs have started doing is uh, they started putting a hardware counter inside the processor. It's part of the processor, part of the chipset that runs the computer. And these are called high speed counters. So I'll try to show you all a little bit about that. So if you're going to deal with any high speed counting application, uh, I don't know if y'all seen some of these uh, manufacturing lines that like make cans and stuff like that. And these cans and these bottles are flying by and they're what? I mean, they're screaming. A software counter just can't do what? Can't keep up with that. So we have high speed counters and I'll try to show you all that uh, later on. I don't know why it says my, that application is locked. But, Now let's already have it open. Let me go to Prog UV. I bet I already I bet I already have it open. That's what it is. So while we have the ability to do here, I should have started a new one. I don't want to mess this up. I don't know what it's doing yet. Is that we have what you're gonna do is you're gonna go to Blackboard and then go to where? Yeah, you know, go into reference material, then the Festo uh, MPS line, and then you're gonna open up your module. And what we're going to do is we're going to do what? We're going to look these over and figure out do we have any questions about anything on the job? We hopefully we understand JFO. Of course, PL portal is really easy. You don't have to know a file number or a function block number or anything. You can just do what? Drag it over. I think I, we're looking at. Don't make any difference. We're looking at PO. We're looking at the. We're looking at the main uh, operational block or the main program. What's that? First pass. Is, uh, first, scan. first pass is that first scan. <laughs> we went back and set that up. That's it. That's going to be one of our uh, computer memory bits, right? 
Uh, they call it first scan. Are we okay there? Okay, so when we when we assign that inside our uh, tag table, uh, we're going to do. I did. I give y'all. Didn't I print out that tag table thing and give it to you? So this is what you're going to do. So what you're going to do is this guy right here's got input zero slash thirteen. You're going to look at the Allen Bradley on your tag table, and you're going to find input zero what slash thirteen. Right? You understand? Then it's going to give you the memory bit that that's a so that I that I've associated that with, right? Y'all understand that? That makes sense. For the semen. For the semen. Okay, y'all understand the table. That's very important. So this is going to be y'all's assignment. It was supposed to be, but I didn't get the table up there long enough. Oh, at least, yeah. I'll have to add to that. Y'all, and I think there's space. Yeah. So there's another one. Y'all have to understand, I've, I've done every bit of this. So that goes to what? So we'll have to map that over. So what would 13 be? Be I, where this is an input. Well, yeah, because eight point two would be a twelve if we have one in there. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Duh. Oh. Yeah, we're going to have to. I know. I, I missed that one. 11 so we're going to have to extend that down and I don't have I don't have the uh, I don't have the original document on here so I'll I'll, uh, I'll add this you're about to add them. so we're doing we're taking input what is it on the diagram so what we're going to do is we're going to go over to M A. Right. Mm -hmm. I, 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 wait, wait, let's get this out of the way. Y'all have, have room down at the bottom to add these? 
I can't do it because I I got the uh, I don't have the original. I got the PDF. Y'all hear what Milton said? So the inputs, the inputs on the Allen Bradley. So the input one slash. Now, we, how many we're going to need out of the uh, so the inputs on the Allen Bradley goes input zero slash how many input how many of those inputs out of low the inputs on the semen goes to input So it goes to input one slash five. So we're not we've only got thirteen inputs, so we don't need to go to fifteen inputs on our chart, right? So our chart should go to what? Thirteen. Good. And then that would be associated with the I one dot five. And then the twelve would be associated with the I one dot four. How far do I go? That's it. So well, which one am I missing? Am I missing four? No. Okay, so we're okay? And then I I fourteen. Zero slash fourteen is gonna be associated with N A dot zero. And then input slash fifteen should be associated with Okay, so which one am I missing? Uh, well, I was talking about That's right, right? Okay, charge okay. So I, the chart is okay. Don't it's laid out right. Y'all didn't have to add anything. Yeah, the eights are moving over to the other module. It's moving to that second module that uh, that we added onto the side, right? And we just left it at the default. We could have moved it to three, but there was really no need for it. And it's a good too to know how we can split these things for. Are we okay? So input one fifteen. No, no, this is first pass. Input 0 slash 13. So 0 slash 13 is going to be input 1.5, right? Are we okay? Yeah. And then what you're going to do now is just do what? Just write the tag out there. Are you okay? Everybody okay? So this is EM, EM underscore Scott stop. They're calling this F1 or FI, I'm sorry. JSR, is you okay there? Bit files, these are our M files. And that's one thing nice about Siemens. Siemens doesn't identify what goes inside memory. It's you to decide how to map the memory out, right? You understand? So there's no such thing as an F8 uh, 
I register because we decide whether it's integer, we decide whether it's floating point. And I'll show you all how to do that too. So when you bring up a math instruction, it's got a little old thing up on the top where you can select whether it's an integer, a double integer, a long integer, or a real number. So a real number is a floating point number, right? You understand that? So you do that in the box itself. So you don't dedicate the memory to a type of, of, of data or not. The, you, you, you select. You're able to, and that way you can manage your memory a lot. Better. So if you need more integers, you can use all for integers. If you need floating point, you can use floating point. But the big problem is, is you got to manage that memory. So if you use, if you use a 16-bit floating point number, you're the one that has to remember that sucker is going to, you specify one address, it's going to do what? It's going to take two. So that means the next address is up. So you, what's nice about the 500, uh, if you put floating point zero, it's isolated from floating point one, right? You understand that. You don't have to worry about the size of the, of the operand. Everybody okay on latching relays? Yeah, on ours it's going to be set and reset, right? And I showed y'all how to bring that. You're going to use those a lot, so I showed y'all how to drag those up to your bar up the top, right? Uh, one shots. We've already talked about that. This is one shot on the rising edge. So we got a comparable, we got a comparable instruction in the sequence for that. If I can get T up, we'll see if we can find that. One shot, we either, we either can do a one shot on the rising or one shot on the falling. Everybody understand the difference there? So one shot would only go true for one scan when the one the rung is connected to goes true, right? A one shot falling would go true when the rung it's connected to goes false. They give us one shot for what? For one scan. The first scan only gives us a one, one shot so it's kind of a one shot, but it only does it when the when the processor is switched to the run mode. So every time you power it up, it'll do that, or every time you switch from switch to the run mode, it'll those that first scan, that's the only time it's gonna do it. So it's it's like a one shot, but it's special, right? You understand? While this is loading up, so I gotta show you all the one. JSRs uh, light, use a ton of latching and latching uh, circuits. Okay, so I'm in auto. Everybody okay there? So y'all look in your auto section and see if there's any problems in there. Some what, some of y'all have timers in the auto section. I think the testing section has timers. Yeah. No, we're going to have to use the timer. Yeah, the, the only thing available. So the problem with using that clock is a division ratio, and you only get the you only get the so making a light blink. If a light blinks two seconds or half a second, it don't really make any difference, right? But if you're if you're waiting on something to give something to time pass. If you use one that's too short, then it's not going to be completed. If you use one too long, then you're increasing the cycle time. I think on, I think the only thing that they use in here is on delay timers. Everybody okay with on delay timers? I'm 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 loading them up. They look they look pretty similar, except uh, they don't call it preset and the, the presets the sets are on the the left hand side is so uh, but it's not it's not much different uh, by the way uh this is the way out this is the way out of browser this is the run that they don't play they don't pay and they they do this crystal right so this is the same run just that it wasn't it was too big to do what print on one one and give it on a page Okay, there makes sense. Latch, unlatch, latch, unlatch, and it pretty much well goes through the sequence. 
And then down at the very bottom of auto, this is where we get into our actually outputs. We okay? Now, when you do your comments, what I want you to do is uh, you start off with English. See that? S16 swivel. Uh, I don't know. Y'all have to look at yours. And then you end up with a bunch of what? German. Don't enter the German. We okay? Then you get into the English on what it actually does. Okay, okay you understand that? So in your run comments, all I want to do is just get the English portion of the comment. I mean, on your network. Uh, unfortunately, or I can't figure out how to do it. Uh, Siemens doesn't allow you to put a comment above a symbol. The only thing I can see is you can do a comment for the network, but you can't do a comment for the symbol. So all these comments down in here, I can't figure out how to do that. If one of y'all can figure out, it would be great. Are we okay? So let's see if my uh, team of portal. So I need to do what? I thought I already created one. Create a new project. I thought I hit create, did I? Yeah. I did. I got one over. Another thing I like about Allen Bradley is when it's, it, it stores your project, it stores it in one file. Siemens projects takes a lot of files. It takes up, but y'all remember how to log in and get to the, uh, or how to map it to our server, right? Uh, then I'm going to do what? I'm going to add a device. Or configure device. And then I'm going to add a new device. You want to put it in the Huh? You want to put it in the No, I don't know. Hold on, let's see how they do these different things. Uh, where's my PC? We could, uh, y'all understand, we can, we could create a project without being connected to the PLC. But instead of me using that auto ID, I would have to find all that information on the PLC and then, and then select that individually, right? Y'all understand that? So you don't necessarily have to be hooked up to a PLC to write a program. Now you do have to be able to, you do need to be hooked up to a PLC. Download and upload. Right? So what's nice about being connected to the PLC is you can let this thing auto identify all that stuff for us. So here I'm using a crossover cable, and of course, if we are over there on the switch, we would need to use a straight through cable, right? Y'all understand? Uh, by the way, uh, what you need to do uh, when you hook these things up, I don't see it up, is there's two lights that's going to blink. Uh, one of them is called the link light, which indicates you've made a link to the network, and it's usually yellow. And then, I'm sorry, it's usually green, and then you should have an amber light that starts flashing. What is the amber light flashing? It's actually sending and receiving data. It doesn't tell you which one you're doing. So if this link light's not on, usually it means that the cable's not inserted in there correctly. If you come in here and you insert it in there correctly, then you should see your link light come on, which usually means the cable's also constructed right. And then right off the bat, when this thing connects, it's going to start identifying itself on the network, right? So these guys are already starting to exchange information. But you should see this guy here start flashing 
uh, just about instantly. And this is even on your routers and your switches at home when you hook that up. Uh, just about all your network uh, interface devices have these two lights on there, green and yellow. What does the green mean? Link, link, and then the yellow means data. So what happens, the green light should come on and stay on, right? You understand? And then the yellow light should start doing what? Flashing. As soon as you plug the cable in, because that's what's going to happen. As soon as you plug that cable in, and then your your network uh, driver in, in finds that, then it's going to start trying to find stuff. It's going to try to find if you're using dynamic or static. If you're using dynamic uh, IPs, it's going to find that DHCP server, right? You understand to configure your IP. So it starts up and it identifies itself to your switches. So your switches learns the MAC address of, of your network. Now, eventually it might slow down or it might stop. That's no big deal. Uh, what you're looking for is on that initial collect connection is you're looking for that yellow light to do what? Bang. Are you okay there? So now that we've got this, what can I do? So I could still come up here and I could come to CPU if I didn't have it hooked up. And I could find, uh, this is a 1214 DC, DC, DC. Uh, then I could select on that. Then I could find the model number on that list that pops up there. I could select that model number and go through that whole procedure. And then I could write a program, and then I can upload it to my PLC later, right? You understand? But what, what would you have to know? You would have to know all that information about your PLC. And the problem we have is once we hook up, once we connect that, that second I.O. port, what do you think we just covered up? We covered up the information about the PLC. So the PLC information is on the right hand side. So for some reason, now this is the information about the about the about the DC card. So I mean the uh, I/O card or the I/O module. So I've got all of this available. But now, if I needed to do that, what would I have to do? I have to take this module off, right, to get to that information. So that's something you need to do uh, when you get a PLC is almost right off the bat document uh, not only the model number but also the actual true model number. So Alan, uh, these guys use that big old model number, not the little one. So see, it uses the big number. So it, not, it don't use the S14 like we did over there. We we chose a Micrologic 1000 or a Micrologic 1100s, right? You understand, or the, or the 504s. Uh, this guy right here, you actually have to know the model number, the true model number of the PLC. Are we okay? If we are connected, then what can we do? We can go to Unidentified. We can come down here and double click on that. And then we can do. Now, once you created a project, a project is married to a PLC. And I don't know if they've got compilers. Uh, I hadn't been able to find out where you could take. A, like a, a, a program uh, written for a step seven, uh, like the thir three fourteens we have up there, and compile that over to a twelve hundred. I'm sure they're out there. It's just we don't have them. So normally, once you write a program, it's it's married to that PLC, right? Does that make sense? Or that model PLC? Uh, I could t since all the PLCs are the same. Uh, once we once we do this, we could download every one of these pro this program. I could download it to yours if I wanted to, right? Okay. As soon as this comes up, y'all look that over and see if we're ready. We're gonna look at timers, right? Any more things? I know some of them has timers in there. This one doesn't have any timers in the auto tape. So this is for this. This is a testing session. Everything on this guy is pretty straightforward, except for the one shot. Are y'all okay there? Uh, there is another thing that we're gonna do uh, that makes it work out better. So this is a subroutine. How do I know it's a subroutine? Because the last instruction would be what? Return. Yeah. You know? I don't think. Uh, I don't think uh, Siemens requires that. Uh, we're going to have to learn how to do this. So what happens when you hit the stop button or when you hit the reset button? What it does, it goes out there and cleans out all your bit files. 
So all those that are set become zero, become reset right automatically. And all of them are three can be reset. Now they do that by filling, filling a group of locations. So they're going to start at using the next address. Right? So with an offset of zero. And then they're going to fill up three bytes of memory. Are we okay? And they're going to do that to the output. So all the outputs are going to be used. They're only using one byte here. Or one whole word. This will take care of 16 outputs. This one command will take care of 16 outputs. And what it's doing is setting all the outputs to zero with one, one command. So we're going to have to figure out how to do that with Siemens. Siemens doesn't have a direct fill command. Uh, it does have a fill command, uh, but you have to set up an array. Uh, so I decided to do it a little different. But this is a lot of bits. How many bits? Three words, right? Okay, 24 bits. 24 outputs with clears out 24 outputs with one instruction. Pretty neat. So that's all we do when you hit that reset. It returns it to its home position, and the way they wired it is that their home position is all the outputs turned off, which is pretty neat. So I'll show you how we can do that. That's a subroutine. What's this subroutine called? P stop, I think. Yeah, e e e p m p e m stop. Yeah, I think p stop is basically the same thing. So this is p stop. So see, it's exactly the same rungs, right? So once we figure out how to do that in e m stop, then we can use that same technique in what in p stop. Everybody okay? And then we get to where we're gonna. This is where they're using the cross couple timers. The cross couple timers. And what they're doing is just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Back and forth. And the light goes on. Huh? And the light goes on. Now that's what makes the lights run. Uh, what we're going to do there is we're going to get rid of the two timers and use one of our uh, timing bits. Okay. I think I used the two hertz. I can't remember. But we, we need to make it flash long enough so we can make them visually, so we can see them, right? Uh, because uh, these, I don't know if these use incandescent lights. or Our our lights, it's not really a free, a, 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 what we call a frame rate. So so these computers are sending up frame pictures. So these are just pictures up here that we call frame. And how does motion picture work? It works exactly the same way. What they do is they, they, they send it at a rate where your eyes don't have time to update. So what does that make our eyes do? It makes us blend them, blend this stuff together, and it makes stuff, even though they're individual still pictures, it makes them appear to be in motion, which is really, really neat. It's called persistence. So computers, we call it frame rates, which is, Rick, is technically individual pictures. Your eyes has what they call a persistence, which means it takes a little while for your for your cones and your rods to do what? Absorb that information and get it to your brain. So what it does, it, it lets us blend things like these lights right here. Y'all know these lights right here are flashing 120 times a second. They are turning off 110 times a second. But what? We can't see it because our persistence is not fast enough and it just blends those uh, together. So if you ever wonder why, if you're a photographer and you take pictures, under fluorescent lights, why the pictures are yellow. So they recommend if you're under fluorescent lights to always use a water, a flash, or an incandescent one. So we'll, we'll substitute this. Uh, we'll substitute this instead of using the timer. I'll, instead of using the timer, we'll just come up here and use one of our, uh, one of our clock times. We'll come over here and we'll put a memory contact, a memory that we're not using. We'll come in on instead of using Timer, we'll just use that contact that's controlled by that memory port, right? Everybody understand that? Okay. Any questions?
this is so neat. But you got to be connected to the PLC. That's the only thing. So who's doing the testing? So are you okay, right? And then the next one we have is the what? Processing. Now what you'll notice is this P org is about the same on every one of these things. So if you did this, you should be okay, right? Are y'all looking at y'all section? So it's almost identical. Some of them are a little different. Uh, this had uh, the one shot. No, that one shot was another one too. Right? And this is auto. So this is the uh, sec uh, the first subroutine. Nothing unusual so far, right? So there's our first one. This is the what? This is the only timer with a time base of one and a preset of three. It's got set up some time for three seconds. Uh, one thing a little different is Siemens uses milliseconds. Milliseconds. So if we wanted to sign for three seconds, then we'd give it a time of 3,000, right? Everybody okay there? You understand that? So we got several timers in here that we need to go back in, but they're all on the late timer, so we don't have to fool with off the late timer. So we need to come out and figure out how to do that. And I think those are the only uh, new commands that if we went to any station, uh, that would be all we could find. Uh, anybody that's doing the, what comes next? Testing, processing, handling. So anybody doing the handling station, is there, if you look yours over and see if there's anything in there that's unusual that we need to talk about. So this is running uh, a DHCP server that's part. It's running a DHCP server that's part of that's part of the Kia portal. So what's happening? It's just fixing to ask me if I want to assign an IP. But we saw how we could manually we come back and reassign it. Right. So we'll just take these defaults so they can communicate with each other. You know, everybody okay on assigning? So there's the MAC address. That's that PLC. That's it. So it's got to know the MAC address before it can assign it an IP. Now it's got to assign an IP to my computer to put it on the same subnet. Does that make sense? If I, if I if my computer was on a different subnet, then these two guys couldn't what? They couldn't talk with each other. So we saw how to rename the PLC. Everybody okay there? And then it comes in and fills everything in for us here in a second. What we're trying to do is look at timers. That was only everybody okay on the on the memory bits, right? We looked at that the other day. 
so we're ready so i can come over here and go to my uh, plc oops it's already open i can go to my program blocks and then we're going to go to ob1 which is comparable the latter two we have ready. So here we are, ladder to network one, right? So they don't start. That's another thing you're going to have to do. Uh, Alan Bradley's diagram starts with run zero. Seaman starts with network one. Everybody understand that? So when you're programming run nine, you're going to be programming network 10. Everybody understand that? Okay. I guarantee you somebody's going to get out of the Okay, this is the box that really uh, I found out how to use. This is every command that the PLC has. So I showed y'all how you can, these are, this is a little better than uh, than the Allen Bradley, uh, where uh, we can hide these, by the way, uh, where these are all our bit commands, these are all our timer commands. So there's our timer commands right there. Okay, and then we got an on delay timer, right? I'm going to come over here and just click on that and drag it over. Place it on there and it pops our timer. When it comes, what do you mean? Okay, so what it's going to do is it's going to assign it a data block. It does this automatically. So on on Allen Bradley's, we have to assign it a, a block of data. We call them C5, right? C5, that's the block. This is going to assign us a block that's free out there. So we'll notice we'll get another block over here in a second. Say okay. Normally we just take the default, but you can give it a name if you wanted to, and then it'll pop the timer. It'll populate with the timer in a minute after it assigns the new block. Notice now it added a system block over here for us, and there it's going to be the block for our timer in there. Okay, we okay? Now this we got this guy right here. We've got three options. We got P2. We think P2 is P2. Let me get this a little bit closer. So we're right here. P2. What would you think P2 would be? You okay back here, Anthony? You go, what? what would PT be? What do you think? What do you think PT would be? What would you think PT would be? Preset. <laughs> By the way, what's neat about Alan Bradley, you can come up here and, le and just left click on any one of them, and then you can hit F1, and then it's going to bring you up everything about that title block that you need to know. Hopefully. Uh, by the way, this is, uh, so uh, this is, this guy don't have any options. Sometimes this is an, but look what I can do here. I can see this little thing up here in the, in the right hand corner right there. Can you see that? I'm going to come over and click that and it brings up a scroll. And I can change this from an off delay timer, on delay timer, retentive timer without, without deleting it and dragging it out, which is pretty. Maybe I'm doing it wrong. I need to go back to it. I thought it was F1. So I've highlighted it. F1. There it is. So on delay timer, off delay timer, and it comes up here and tells us what everything is. So PT, what is this? What is this? Duration of the time delay, tagging the PT, right? Understand that. Must be what? Quantum positive. The ET is our what? Current time. The Q is what? Output. So you don't necessarily have to use PT, but you can. So you can use compare instructions and make things happen during certain times, right? Y'all understand that? So you could assign ET to a memory address, and then that memory address would be updated all the time. And then you can say, okay, uh, like I've got a program on the RS Logics 
where I got one timer that turns the motor on, lets it run forward for a certain amount of time, turns the motor off, lets it pause, gives it enough time to stop, then runs it in reverse. How many timers am I using? I'm using one, right? Because what I'm doing is I'm using a compare instruction. I'm looking at that accumulator to see when it's between a certain range. Well, that would be, this is the, this is equivalent to the timer accumulator, that ET, right? You understand. But instead of it being assigned a memory address, I have to assign it a memory address. And we'd use one of our memories, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Normally, you'd put it out of, out of what you're going to use. So memory is just basically, if I, if I, I might use M20, which is always, it's way out of anything that I'm using, right? You understand? I might use that for my timer. Uh, we're not trying to do that, I don't think. So I, it tells me everything I need to know. I'm going to come up here and close this out, and then it should take me back to my ladder. So I'm going to come up here and I assign a time. I need a three-second delay. I'm going to come up here and type in 3,000. Or I can pull that from a memory location, right? You understand? From a tag. I come over and type, hit that. Then I'm, gonna, I'm not going to, if I'm not using that elapsed time, it don't make any difference. I just leave it blank. And then I come up here and do what? I just add an output coil. Oops, wrong thing. I thought it would let me drag it. And then I would assign this an internal coil, probably. Right, you understand? Are you okay? Yeah, that's the Q. The Q is the output for the time. What's that? Now these are these are the old method. So if you were doing if you were doing set, step seven, so what they've done is uh, most of your languages now. So we had we had we had uh, ladder diagrams. So in ladder, ladder diagram, these are coils. Period. Uh, then they came out what they call function block programming, where where, where you use symbols instead of coil symbols, right? So every device has a symbol. Well, just about all your programming languages that I've noticed, they've combined both of them. So it's up to you. You can use the ladder logic symbol or you can use the function block symbol. So we're in between two programming languages. So yeah, I could come over here and use this and I could move that in there. But then what I got to do, and I've done this before, it's taken a little while. I'd have to figure out, you put one, I think you put the time on the bottom and you, so you have different on top and bottom of the symbols where you assign uh, you'll sign the time. So yeah, you're more than welcome to use these if you want to. But notice when I put this symbol over there, I have two options that I need to do what? I need to assign. And I'd have to come in and I would have to, I'd look it up and see which one is the time and which, what what the other one is. So one of them is probably time, the other one's probably elapsed time. And then this would go true. So that, that's a really good question. So this is using old relay logic, right? You understand? These guys right here are, are, are punch blocks. This is pretty good. Good question. Any more? So we've set this up, but then I'd come up here and I would assign this a memory contact. I'm going to assign it a memory contact, probably that's not on that chart, because I think all those contacts. So I might assign it, uh, you know, I might assign it what? Uh, 20.0. Uh, and then it's going to come up. Save my tag. Now, if I go this method, what do we need to do now? It automatically assigns it a tag. And it's going to do them in consecutive order. So it's up to you how you want to do this. So one method is to go ahead and enter the addresses, and then you can come up here and just uh, come up here and just uh, right click and go to what? I'm sorry, go to the tag, right click and then say what? Rename tag, and then you can give the tag a name whatever it is on there, and then hit change. But you would be doing that all the time, right? You understand? What's nice is go ahead and establish your tags, and then from then on, you're just going down through there and just typing in tag. You don't even have to type in the tag. All you got to do is just start the tag name, and then it'll pop up there and populate. If you type in S, it's going to pop, it's going to pop every tag up that starts with S. Then if you add another letter, then your then your then your uh, tag table uh, the available tags will start decreasing. 
So how do we assign tags before we get started? Yeah, we go down here, uh, go over here into the project tree, and then go back to what? Yeah, PLC tags, and then go to what? Default tags, and then you can just start entering here, right? That's time. Good class today, right? Yeah. There you go.